My name is Sherry Siegel, and I'd like to welcome you to the YPO and C200 program on ESG for women business leaders. This presentation will last approximately one hour. If you have any questions for our speakers, please submit them via the Q&A box on your Zoom screen, and we'll do the best to get to them during the Q&A session. Please note that this call is being recorded and the recording link will be available in the next day or two. Before we get going, I'd like to start off by getting to know you with a few poll questions. Our first poll, Jean, if you'd uh, load that. Uh, what type of organization do you lead? Publicly traded for-profit, private for-profit, NGO, or not-for-profit? Okay, it, lo it looks like we have most of our results. Um, and it looks like we are predominantly private and for-profit, but a nice showing of not-for-profit. Uh, Jean, can we load our next poll? Okay, so this is a yes or no. Are you being asked for increased environmental or social disclosure by investors, lenders, or customers? <laughs> It definitely looks like most of you are, 91%. And then, uh, Jean, if we can have our final poll. How central is consideration of sustainability factors to your business? We incorporate uh, material, environmental, human capital, um, yeah, sorry, social, and um, other elements into our business strategy and executive KPIs. We've begun talking about how to identify ESG issues and started to set goals. We know these issues are being discussed in the zeitgeist, but are not currently changing how we do things in a major way. And I don't know, and I'm not sure how ESG is different. Okay, and it, it looks like the majority of you um, are getting started, a few on the way and a few thinking about it, but 67%, uh, this is really starting to be an issue. So with that, uh, let's get started. And now that we know a little about you, uh, we'll start with who we are and our ESG journeys. I've been a corporate lawyer for most of my career, focusing at various times on corporate restructuring, crisis management, business ethics, anti-corruption programs, investment management, and corporate governance. To me, all of those activities meant using broad stakeholder engagement and in consideration for success. In 2017, I decided to follow my passion and get an MBA in sustainable innovation. At the time, many of my peers thought it was sort of a sweet, do-gooder, pipe dream motivated endeavor and not necessarily a core business strategy. Well, fast forward four years and sustainability or ESG have gone from niche to mainstream topics. Our three panelists are all leaders of multinational or global organizations with different experiences ranging from large corporations, social enterprises, NGOs, for-profit alliances, and not-for-profit organizations. Each comes with her own unique perspective reflecting her individual journey, addressing the environmental, social, risk management, stakeholder engagement, and governance issues that we refer to as ESG or sustainable these days. Joining me today are Julie Fasson Holder, the former senior vice president of Dow Chemical and current board member of Eastman Chemical and WR Grace and trustee for the McLaren Northern Michigan Regional Hospital. Carrie Freeman is the co-CEO of Second Muse, an inc incubator and accelerator of social enterprises and other innovative programs 
also stakeholder engagement facilitator and partner with governmental or NGO organizations ranging from NYSERDA to NASA. And Melissa Ackerman, who serves as the president of the Produce Alliance, which connects growers and distributors of produce and founded the PA Foundation Farmers to Families Food Box Program. To start things off, would, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to tell us a little bit about her sustainability journey and how ESG fits into their organization's life. So Julie, can uh, you start us off? I would be happy to. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you. And thank you for having me. Delighted to be here and looking forward to the discussion. So as Sherry mentioned, I had my corporate career at Dow Chemical. And as a chemical manufacturer, as you would imagine, um, certainly the environmental part of ESG was key uh, in our license to operate and in everything we did. So I would say I grew up with kind of that experience uh, in my DNA. And then as I joined uh, two public company boards, um, as over the years, the investor interest in ESG has become um, very loud and deafening and our investors are very interested today as we continue to read and you hear about every day. And I chair the Environmental Safety and Sustainability Committee at Eastman Chemical and I chaired the Sustainability Committee at WR Grace. And as we have moved forward over the course of these last three or four years, our investors are asking about it routinely. Um, disclosures are becoming more important. People are deciding whether they're gonna invest in you based on um, your ESG strategies. ESG is becoming an integral part of our strategy as we look at our opportunities to grow and where we can innovate. And um, I think the, the whole dimension of both envir environment, um, social and governance, those three pillars are something that we're all paying significant amount of attention to. And we're making sure that everything we do, we think about and we include those dimensions as we put together our business strategies. Thank you. And Carrie, you wanted, uh give us a little bit of your background and how you come at this? Absolutely, and I will say good morning. So for those of us who have not hit afternoon yet, good morning. <laughs> um, so much so much gratitude for being here. It's great to convene everyone. The downside is we can't see everyone's lovely faces. So anyway, but um, I trust that people are really interested in this topic. I feel like ESG has broadly been um, a part of my my entire career, uh, spanning back to actually in high school, this notion that businesses could be a force for good, right? The terms have changed. In college, I studied ethics and corporate responsibility, um, really embracing the concepts of natural capitalism and you know human capital and the, all the different types of capital, not just financial capital. But um, so much of the so much of the philosophy has stayed the same, right? How do you take an expanded view to your stakeholders? beyond just the, the financial aspect. Um, I helped form the corporate sustainability group at Intel. And then from there, I also looked at how um, all the assets of a corporation could be used to further um, social and environmental um, innovation, justice, et cetera. So really kind of looking at it from a large corporate perspective, a, a thought leader and, and a um, corporation with a significant um, ethical component to it. And now as co-CEO of Second Muse, our whole focus is on how do we build economies that benefit uh, all people and the planet. And so we really believe that our um, economies were built in a somewhat flawed way um, in the past century or so with the notion that um, we don't have to pay attention to the negative externalities. So that this, the negative environmental impact, um, we've harmed oftentimes humans, We've also made great progress overall as a, as a humankind. So there's, you know, there's an acknowledgement of that, but how do we really use the markets to um, change things and look at uh, how we can address social challenges and environmental ones. And so that's, we're in the business of doing that. We support entrepreneurs um, all around the globe for this. We engage with corporations, with public entities, 
um, and governments, et cetera. So it's, it's really very much of what we do. We are a certified B Corp. And that's one of the things that significantly guides us as well in terms of how to do it. And I'll get into more of that, but I think it's important to not only say we're doing this, we're committed to it, but actually finding mechanisms to go forth and do it. Thank you. And Melissa, um, tell us about your journey. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. And um, I think my journey is um, a little bit more natural, <clears throat> if you will. Our company is a... Um, it, we manage the supply chain from field to fork for growers and um, shippers and restaurants, all different food service suppliers. So prior to the pandemic, our traditional business, we work with all different customers, such as Chili's, Maggiano's, Jamba Juice, um, Benihana, and so um, and all different types of you know hotels and and cruise ships and things of that matter. So when we were doing RFPs always during those RFP processes, we were asked questions of what we're doing on the sustain sustainability. We were doing the kind of the things that Carrie was just mentioning, asking us what we were doing for suppliers. Um, we work with many of the major companies, obviously I can't mention all of them here, but um, that would push us to do better. And we would work with local growers on a national scale. We would work to help them get food safety things passed and all of those um, different types of what we could do to help. We don't own our distributors. Um, they are members of our organization. So, but we buy um, what we are one of the biggest buyers of growers in California of the Driscoll's and of the Grimways on the food service side. So that's kind of where our journey began. But when the pandemic hit and when you saw the onions being tilled under or being thrown away and the milk being spilled, that was where we were. And I can remember still a mom's group in a text saying to me like, why can they just not get the you know, onions to the food banks? Why can't they just get the stuff from there to New York? Like, why is this stuff going bad? And and literally, I, and my husband still to this day is like, can you remember sitting in your bathroom on the floor, just like so angry trying to text and trying to explain supply chain to people that just don't understand supply chain. And so um, that's really where my journey started. And I'll get a little bit more into that, but we had to quickly pivot and figure out what can we do. And so my journey really of how, that naturally changed our business model began then. Um, we had had a 501c3 or um, foundation for six years that really rallied around our community and family of growers, shippers, and end users to help in times of need. But we used that organization, our 501c3, to really um, take the Pro the, the product that was sitting idle in the field and do something with it. And now that has changed our business model for the good. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you each. Um, it sounds like each of you has come to embrace broader systems relationships that go well beyond the board, senior management, investors, and customers. I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into that. Uh, Carrie, I know promoting robust stakeholder engagement is at the very heart of Second Muse's purpose. Could you tell us a little bit about how you help entrepreneurs and organizations create systems maps and identify and engage stakeholders? Yeah, absolutely. So systems maps, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, go Google um, causal loop systems maps. I'm uh, guessing that a lot of people are familiar with it. It is this notion of how do you take into account an entire system when you're trying to address challenges in that system. And one of the tools that we use, we're members of the Academy for Systemic Change, and we really think broadly about systems and apply systems thinking methodologies. And one of those is using systems maps. And it's, it's really an opportunity for people to build out a map to understand a system. So, you know, Melissa's saying, how, how do people not understand or, you know, please help me guide people in, in understanding the intricacies of the supply chain because they're incredibly complex. And all of our challenges um, related to sustainability are incredibly complex, right? We've gotten into this place because there's lots of different, lots of different dimensions, lots of different organizations, players, issues, et cetera. And developing out a systems map helps people contribute to a map, understand the realities um, through multiple different lenses. I think oftentimes, even those of us with the best intentions come to challenges and view challenges through our own lens, right? And oftentimes those are cyber lenses. And so the intent of us coming together and using a tool like this is to get input 
from everyone and then actually convene people around this and say, look, there's multiple truths here. And if we're trying to really understand what the barriers are to creating more sustainable systems, um, you know, it's good to understand the big picture. And then from there, um, understanding where are their leverage points? And so where are there different things? Sometimes it's low hanging fruit. Sometimes it's a big aha. I will tell you um, an area, and I'll, I'll keep moving on with the food theme, but we were working several years ago to develop out a systems map um, to understand how um, growers could plant more climate resilient maize seed in sub-Saharan Africa. And, um, you know, we had, think of all the big players um, across both the public and the private sector trying, you know, really scratching their heads saying, we don't understand why we can't get this. This is an incredibly important thing to happen. And through doing the, a systems map, literally we're in Washington, DC, and the big aha in the room was, and this is by people who'd been working on this area for, you know, their entire, their entire profession, 20, 30 years is that, um, the markets there are dominated by the informal sector. And so if we continue to try to distribute seed through the formal sector, right through distributors, we're not going to um, accelerate the pace of um, more, more climate resilient um, farms, basically. And so this whole idea of like, oh my goodness, a systems map illuminated the need to actually more deeply understand um, understand the challenge and understand, hey, we have to completely change our way of thinking and our way of operating so that we're actually engaging the informal sector more. Um, and from there, you can have business models and new um, areas of entrepreneurship, but, but it's really hard to get um, new business models wrapped around these challenges if you don't actually understand what you're solving for. And it was, it was one of those moments where I'm like, oh my goodness, his, this is the power of a systems map. So. Sorry, there was a train going by and I <laughs> muted. Uh, so uh, sticking with uh, the food theme, uh, Melissa, can you talk a little bit more, you, you started to in your intro about um, disruptions due to COVID and how that caused you to enhance and broaden your engagement models and expand your relationships. And I think like what you're saying, I didn't do the systems map, but I think I actually did that without <laughs> actually doing it. Now I want to sit down with you, Carrie, and actually do a debrief and see if I did that and we can go further. Because um, so after the um, March 2020, like when you can't imagine losing 30 or 70% of your business overnight, um, schools, everything closing, we worked to take all of this product across the country. I have a full cold chain, you know, distributors, 100 distributors across the country. And through our foundation, we were able to move a product that was stuck in the, um, through the cold chain and work with do first donations to get our trucks that were sitting idle at hospitals, you know, all over the country, Cedars to at Boston, Mass General, um, with YPO donations and then donations from corporate entities and pull up at the end of shifts um, of COVID units and bring boxes of produce to people that were um, coming off their shifts at 7 and, at seven a.m. or 7 p.m. and give them the boxes of gross of produce as they were walking out. And this really just showed our ability to be able to do this on a national scale. So when Farmers to Families from the last administration came out with their um, their RFP process of this new innovative way, which is different than anything that had been done. And it was a $5 billion program. We won, um, I believe the biggest award, which was a $300 million award, 9.2 million boxes in 15 states, um, which our, our supply chain had never done. And we did it 99.8%. And it used a supply chain that had never gotten food anywhere. And when I sit down and talk to people, and I'd love to talk to anyone further about this, we were actually deciding, and I worked with um, Emily Broadlieb um, at Harvard Law Policy Group. I worked with individuals in every city to decide where does this food go to make sure that it was going to the right counties and the right places. And it was checked by the government um, to make sure it was the right plan. But we used um, faith-based organizations. We worked with the food banks. We worked with 
all of the um, mutual aid societies, domestic violence shelters, and we use a cold, we dropped, um, drop reefers in individual places that would then come and pick up like a hub spoke model. And so we were able to get it very deep into the communities and then have wraparound services in a time when people weren't going out as much and seeing people and talking to people. So you saw these benefits of um, either diaper services coming around and helping giving diapers out, giving out many other services and like the social, you know, um, movement to do more than just the food. And so that that ended in June of um, 2021. And from there, our company has then continued to do more programs um, in the private, continuing on our private journey and on our philanthropy journey to um, keep these programs alive. So it really has changed. And I heard somebody say it, it's like that finding the good between doing business and doing good um, to be able to find that, that that line of business that keeps your business moving in the right direction, but also helping to find that centered um, where you can find ESG in everything that you're doing. And there's a big sector of that that's also helping with the, the growers of California and our main growers in our business that we wanna take the stuff that's left in the fields and buy that product. So that's something where I need to do the mapping because that's a program that I'm working on heavily. So I can talk about that in my next section. Next section. <laughs> and um, thank, you, thank you, Melissa. And Julie, uh, can you talk a little bit about how analysis and engagement with ESG factors has changed in the C-suite and boardroom during your career? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think as uh, both Melissa and Carrie stated, the thing that's really important is resilience and, you know, being able to learn quickly and change quickly and manage risk. And, you know, um, ESG factors are both a risk and an opportunity. And as good um, stakeholders, you have to kind of think on both sides of that dimension in terms of, do I have business that's at risk because of ESG issues? And do I have business opportunities because of ESG issues? So learning quickly and being resilient and being transparent with your stakeholders and engaging your stakeholders. I think if anything, probably corporate America has learned over the course of the last few years is engagement with stakeholders, transparency, metrics, so that we have a narrative that we can articulate what we are doing on this front. And, it, and it's important to be able to articulate your narrative in a way that your stakeholders can understand. So, you know, in the chemical industry, as you would imagine, you have some products that may have risks as a result of ESG issues. But I, the most um, exciting part for me is the innovation opportunity you have as a result. So many in the industry are looking at recycling opportunities. And as you look into your roots, which are typically the chemistries that your founders you know, started the company with, how do you take those chemistries and really look at how do we make the world a better place as a result of them? How do we solve the world's toughest problems, whether it's around recycling or it's around clean water or it's around clean energy? And then how do we articulate that to our stakeholders? How do we measure our progress? How do we um, build a diverse and sustainable workforce? Because that's another significant part of ESG that corporate stakeholders are very interested in. And then um, how do we tell our story in a way that's compelling, that makes people want to engage with you, wants to invest in you, and believes you because you can show them along the way that this isn't just all talk, but we're actually delivering on what we say we're going to do. Thank you. And um... You know, going back to our poll, we know that we have a cross section of for profit and not for profit enterprises. So I'd like to move a little bit to how the themes we've been discussing carry across the sectors and how it doesn't matter if it's for profit, not for profit, NGO, social enterprise, um, which, in case anybody doesn't know the term social enterprise, is generally a, a for-profit business, but has as its core purpose, some positive social or environmental impact. 
and Carrie can correct me if I got that wrong. Uh, we good? We're good, yeah. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Uh, so Melissa, let's uh, dive a little bit more into how creating the box program that you talked about is changing how you're doing things on the for-profit side of your business. Sure, so we have created a new like line of our business that is going to be working on new changes and it continues to evolve. It's definitely a journey, but we've been working with individuals like um, WWF, World Wildlife Federation Foundation, and they're looking at the data of like how much produce is disked um, because it's cost more money to har to harvest it than to take it out based on the specs of what is wanted for either the food service or the retail industry. So we're looking at using data in that line to be able to create a business line that would work with the whole industry, with our with our, um, our trade associations and everything to create basically a third channel that we could work on to be able to buy these products and then move them into a new line of business that would go to a 501c3 organization. The, so that the end user would never pay for anything on these products. This is like, you know, more innovative, newer stuff, but this would have to be in a for-profit type of business because of what it would take to be able to do all this. It works within our traditional model of how we move product, how we do things. But in my mind's eye, it's a business that I think would have to be a social enterprise type of business and moving things. And I think the word transparency is the most important piece of all. Because if you're transparent in how we're doing all of these things, then we can do it. If there's no transparency in how we're making the business move, then I think that it becomes a bidding war. And the only people that really lose out on it is the quality of the product that comes out and what happens um, for the people who are getting that product. So um, that's one piece. And the second piece is we're doing many box product uh, programs that are created with the funders in mind. So we're doing different box programs throughout the country that have education pieces. So like what comes in the boxes? Is there um, education around what do we do with the product? Is there education of what does this fresh product and fresh produce um, how does it change your body? How does it change your food? We're doing um, our produce RX boxes. So can you eat to change how your ending, you know, your um, how this will change your um, end result and how you live your lives? So I think there's a lot of different things that can be done with this model that we've learned about over the last 18 months and using the supply chain with food service um, as a beginning point. Um, and we are working with different growers, so different food hubs, different um, BIPOC farmers as an umbrella organization to take all of these different growers and let them have some type of ecosystem to be able to bring these products together. So that's where we're using our social enterprise thought process to be able to use it as a stepping stone to also work with the food service sector um, in total. So I think it's kind of like a, a, a puzzle piece within our total business in general. Thank you. And Julie, uh, you spend a lot of time in the for-profit corporate boardroom, but also you're a trustee of a not-for-profit. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about where there are commonalities and where there are places where you see the need for different engagement styles or management processes for these types of organizations? Well, I would say there are more commonalities than differences, but it's just the way they're implemented, perhaps, that's different. Um, you know, as you would imagine, being a trustee for a hospital during COVID times, um, the need for a focus on our employees and our patients um, is absolutely critical. And anyone who's spending any time in the hospital industry today knows that we have a shortage of staff. Um, hospitals are overflowing with both patients who put things off because of COVID as well as COVID patients. And it's more critical than ever that our processes for quality are good. And I think what we're learning is where there are any holes in our processes to be able to um, make very quick decisions, move people around. I mean, the one thing that 
I have been astounded by um, in learning the healthcare industry and particularly the hospital industry is the supply chain or the movement, the logistics of patients in a hospital and how you move them from the emergency department, the intensive care unit up to the floor, how you release people on time so that you can make maximum use of your beds. And we are spending a significant amount of time on that, which is very similar to logistics studies that we did in my corporate career, you know, moving products around or as um, Carrie and Melissa both talked about as COVID hit, you know, moving food to the people that need it. How do we move our patients around um, and particularly with a staff shortage to be able to serve them well and um, serve as many people as we can. So I think, um, you know, and then if I talk about, okay, so the chemical industry, so how is that the same and how is it different? It's the same in that this type of thinking has to be part of your strategy and part of your critical thinking and part of your resilience and uh, part of your risk management. And so whether it be, you know, one of the things that we're working hard on in one of my companies is recycling technology. So how do we take old carpet, old clothes? How do we have a supply chain to get them back to the factories and then actually use them as fuel um, to make virgin chemicals again? And, um, you know, thinking about, that is something that three or four years ago, you know, probably never would have been in our radar. But today, it's a real key part of our growth strategy, as many in our industry are thinking about recycling technologies and how do we really bring those to bear um, to be able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to be able to basically um, use the things that we make to make us a more environmentally friendly and um, less of an emitter in the products that we make. So my view would be uh, your challenges are similar, how you implement them are different, but the kind of thinking that you have to do, risk management, resiliency, stakeholder engagement, those things transcend whether it's nonprofit or for profit to make you a sustainable enterprise because you know sustainability at its very core means that you're going to be around and to be around you have to be able to satisfy all of your stakeholders in a way that allows you to continue to operate. Thank you. And uh, Carrie, you're constantly bringing different types of organizations together. What's your secret sauce for finding the commonalities that create successful partnerships or engagements? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So this time I'll pick up off of what Julie was saying in terms of really thinking about the opportunities um, around just recycling and in general, how do we think about um, the waste that's being put out? And so I will, I'll give an example. I'll share the share some of the secret sauce ingredients. Um, I don't think they're that secret. I think they, they take patience and intentionality, but um, one of the programs that we work on and really need is called the Incubator Network. And it is focused on how do we eliminate ocean plastic and broadly, how do we reduce um, plastics going into our environment? Um, and we've started out by specifically focusing on Southeast Asia, although the um, intention is to expand that. If you look most broadly at where ocean plastics have accumulated, it is in um, the Southeast Asia region. And so in that case, there is a recognition, a significant recognition just a few years ago. Um, it was announced at the G7 and, and just more broadly looking at um, how different players need to come together to actually address this challenge, right? Because it's a significant challenge. It's everything from um, the petroleum companies that are, um, you know, providing the raw inputs into different forms of plastics to the design of products to the supply chain. Um, that uses them to the end, the end um, consumers on what do you do with them, right? What do you do with plastic bottles? I mean, we all have them everywhere. It's, it's plastic has, you know, it's, it's a wonderful, beautiful product and it's invaded our, um, it's invaded our, our lives and our environment, unfortunately, in ways that are oftentimes not healthy for the environment or for humans. Um, but this recognition that so much of our um, supply chains and our products have actually really been built around that. And so, Part of this is this idea of how do you bring stakeholders together to really address a common thing, recognizing that it's complex. So um, 
in the case of this, we've partnered with um, many, many different organizations, but our key partner is Circulate Capital, um, which is a venture capital arm, and with funders coming in from several of the CPG and oil and gas companies, as well as um, the Circulate Initiative, which is a nonprofit that partners um, with Circulate Capital, but also um, incubators and accelerators all over Southeast Asia that are saying, how do we help entrepreneurs see this as an opportunity? Everything from designing products at the very beginning of this, right? Um, you know, how do you eliminate plastics from um, takeout food, for example, all the way to the end um, in terms of working with municipalities to actually recycle. And then recognizing that throughout this, um, women's lives are often most impacted because they're the ones dealing with plastics. And so I think it's this idea of recognizing, once again, taking a system approach and recognizing what is the role of different organizations in convening them, saying, look, we all have a common goal of reducing um, plastics in our environment, and specifically with those that leak into the ocean. And um, so, so one of the things is just understanding and, and bringing together the different system stakeholders. And we work with so many organizations. Um, we've been working pretty significantly with the World Economic Forum and all of their members at some of our sites um, in Indonesia, specifically in Surabaya. And um, it is this idea that it's also hard. <laughs> so I, I think we never shy away from the fact that it's, it's complicated, it's hard. It takes a lot of time and effort, but the end results are so much better. Um, on, a, on a smaller scale, I think, and on a more intimate scale on partners that you're bringing together, it is oftentimes this like real deep clarity on how we're going to work together, right? And that this is a long-term problem. Because I think sometimes if people say, oh, we're gonna get in and we're just gonna work together for the next year, unless it's a true pilot program and it's well understood, um, things don't happen in a year, right? We've had a centuries of, of systems that have created these challenges. And so thinking that we're going to solve it. So being very reasonable in what you expect. I think like, how do we partner together and being very intentional about the relationships in which we're forming? How do you exit out of relationships? How do you know when you've had some sort of success? So I think probably the biggest um, item of the secret sauce is patience and intentionality. Intentionality in um, how we engage together. So um, it's, it's, it's very much like, how do you collaborate? And it's, it's, it's hard work, but that's the only way we're going to address a lot of these challenges. And um, before we open up to audience Q&A, um, I'd like to ask each of you um, whether you have a question you'd like to ask another panelist or, and, whether you have a call to action, either for the other panelists or for the members of our audience. And I'm just gonna let you have at it and free for all. Go. Oh. Well, I'll start. Um, you know, I think from the original poll that you took at the beginning, a lot of our uh, audience is getting started um, on these issues and thinking about them, which is wonderful, and attending webinars like this. And there are many webinars I find now on these issues that you can avail yourself of to learn more, uh, depending on what sector you're in and what you're trying to learn. So I would say one, be a fast learner. Thank you for you know coming here to begin learning, um, but make sure you accelerate your journey because uh, as uh, Carrie just said, it is a journey, but it's one that's becoming increasingly important. And I do believe that the companies and organizations that are gonna be really successful are gonna integrate this into their strategy. So it really becomes kind of part of who you are as an organization and ESG is not uh, adjacent to your strategy, but it's part of your strategy. So I would encourage our audience to continue to think of it in that way and to um, think about how they can be more successful in managing both the risks they face on the negative side, but the opportunities that they have on the positive side to really make a difference. Thank you. I think I would say that for me, um, trying to do things and getting into any grants or getting into anything you can do, I would open up your um, pool of people that you're offering to do grants to new people. I think a lot of companies have the line items of what they're doing to the same organizations and the same 
you can't get any new results and if you only allow the organizations that you've been working with for a long time. So I would say um, open up your ability to newer organizations that could um, potentially get different changes and um, look outside of the same groups that you've worked with for a long time, because I think that will allow for more things to happen and newer things have happened. Also, I think new, because of the pandemic, there's different groups doing different things. I think that many, for example, um, when we were doing the program, new supply chains have happened. Many different feeding programs are now happening through community organizations and some food banks that were feeding people in the past are now changing the way that they're doing things. So I think look outside the box um, for programs of how you're using the donation monies that you have and the grant monies you have to look further into newer organizations. Yeah. I'll pick up on both of those. And I, I think one of the things is how do we, every single organization has strategic objectives, right? That we're trying to do. And I, and I think it's a, I mean, we, we, while we work in a very collaborative space, we also work in a competitive, right? You actually, you can't do good if you don't have a business or an organization to actually do good with, right? I tell people that all the time. Why do you focus on, on the financials, Carrie? Why do you focus on the profit side of things? And I'm like, well, if we don't exist, we can't do good. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very simple, it seems, you know, kind of like a, a no-brainer, but it's one of those simple things. But I do think this recognition that um, companies and organizations have to think about how they go beyond their own their own siloed strategic needs and think about where are there opportunities to collaborate, where are there opportunities to do things that, um, you know, if you look at the Venn diagram, maybe, you know, maybe a collaboration or a partnership is, is um, not fully covered by all your strategic needs, but a lot of them are. So if you're thinking of supply chain issues or any sort of issue really that, that requires multiple stakeholders, this recognition that um, at times you're going to have to invest in the collective good quite frankly, right? We cannot continue to operate in this um, fully individualistic um, shareholder, stakeholder, siloed approach. It has to be this notion of the collective good. So I think that's one of the things of, you know, flex your muscles, it's hard. Um, it's hard on all fronts, small organizations, large organizations, but how do, how do organizations come together to do that? Thank you. And um, I see we have a couple questions coming in. I'm going to invite more questions and I'm going to take moderator's prerogative and ask one that um, I'm dying to know more about, which is Carrie, tell us about NASA. <laughs> I know this is, I know you said you were gonna bring this in. So we've been working, NASA is one of our longest term partners slash clients. And we've been working with NASA for almost 15 years. And we started working with them um, really in the innovation space and call it broadly open innovation space. but. If you think about um, the International Space Station or the moon or Mars or wherever, um, it is probably the most well-defined, understood um, area of circularity, right? For people to live up there, it is a truly circular environment. And so when you start thinking about both the opportunities that NASA has to develop um, new technologies um, and, and ways of operating um, and bring them into the missions or whether it is saying, hey, there's a whole slew of interesting um, um, ideas, solutions, IP that could be spun out of NASA. It's this idea of how do you collectively come together? And so we started working with NASA in their open innovation space with a program called Launch that was very focused on um, circularity. And then we had partners with USAID, the State Department, Nike, Ikea came into play, um, eBay, we've had so many partners and it's really in, around this idea of um, how do you integrate circularity into things more. So, so yes, NASA, think of NASA, if you hadn't thought of that before, think of it as like the most, uh, the, the mission to Mars is the most cir circular, circular endeavor ever. Um, and as part of that process, um, they're also the largest um, repository of earth sciences data in the world, right? There's several, several satellite companies um, that are doing really good work now that have sprung up, but um, still NASA and its other and the other international um, space agencies have the largest repository. So when we're talking about understanding things, right? It's you know the, the work of WWF or the work of other organizations to say how do we how do we understand um, food loss, right? How do we understand um, our watersheds better? How do we understand all these issues better? Well we do so through data. 
So um, we've been working with NASA to open up their data sets. They've opened up their data sets as well, but how do you get citizen scientists and people all around the world um, developing solutions to our, our Earth and uh, planetary challenges? And so we run the International Space Apps Challenge. We did that this year, it's the 10th year. We helped design it. Um, we have almost 30,000 people, over 160 countries, 10 international space agencies. Um, but it's this like amazing amalgamation and like beautiful thing of people all around the globe saying, hey, we can create solutions using data to better understand, um, preserve, protect, um, and you know, better utilize our earth resources and explore and explore space. So yeah, it's it's one of those fun things. And when we think about it, that's really the, the early genesis of creating more sustainable economies, right? It's these ideas, it's these partnerships, it's these people coming together and saying, hey, you know, let's solve challenges. So we really see it as, as kind of the, the um, early stages of building new economies. It's these this ideation and this collaboration. So it's it's fun too. It's just, I mean, who doesn't get excited about that? <laughs> As well, you know, I did. <laughs> I know. We do too. We love it. <laughs> um, we, we have a couple of questions from the audience that um, relate to governance and uh, to the notion that somehow uh, when the questioner um, starts talking about governance, people immediately switch to environmental and social and leave governance out. Um, and I, I, I think that part of it is, how do you talk about the processes? How do you talk about transparency? And how do you make those things um, integral to overall um, organization governance. Um, maybe Julie, do you want to start us off on that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so when I think of good governance, I think of all of the stakeholders that we serve. So I think first off, you know, thinking broadly about, you know, who are our stakeholders, our employees, our customers, our communities that we operate in, you know, because sustainability and governance, I think, go hand in hand. It's like, how, how do we assure that, in fact, we have taken the interests of our stakeholders and incorporated them into our strategies and deliver for them and not forgetting one versus the other. So I think that's kind of the first part that I think about governance. Um, and then I also think about our people. And if you think about the boardroom and you think about governance, um, I think with this whole focus on ESG, it really says it's not just finance as perhaps those were the people that had the expertise that sat in the boardroom before. The reason that we need diverse perspectives around the table is because diverse perspectives um, bring us things that perhaps we haven't thought of in realms that are important to our stakeholders today. So I think about the people in the boardroom and the fact that we do have diverse perspectives around the table. Are we listening to the people that we're affecting? Um, I also um, think about the culture in the company in which we operate and are, do we understand that? And are we sure that um, you know, we have the right culture to achieve what we need to achieve? So governance to me is kind of the umbrella as I think perhaps the question was written. And um, you know, our shareholders over the course of the last decade have really asked companies to focus on governance and have looked at things like shareholder rights and um, our risk structure and risk management and committee structure and you know that the right people are sitting around the table. So I think ES do kind of fold under governance because it is part of your whole license to operate and, and part of how you build a sustainable company for the future. So I don't see them separate, I do see them integrated. So I, I personally have my favorite rant about how ESG is a misnomer because it's all governance. Um, but I'd like to also follow up on one aspect of governance. Uh, we've talked a little bit about policy setting. We've talked a little bit about disclosure and transparency. 
What about incentive structures? Yeah, you know, how do you tie environmental and social goals or risk management to executive and even line employee incentives? Do you want me to take a stab at that or? You volunteered. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think again, that's a discussion that we're having in the boardroom for sure. And, um, you know, and again, our shareholders are, are asking us these questions as well. And so one of the things that one of my companies did is recently published a sustainability report, um, which basically had metrics out there that you'll be able to follow us every year, whether it be how diverse our population is, um, how we're, you know, changing the makeup of our company, what our emissions are, what our greenhouse gas goals are. So I think a lot of it is around um, data and transparency with your data. And then the, the last part of the discussion that we have is, okay, so which of these parts should we tie our executive leadership's pay to and um, you know, make sure we are delivering on the promises that we're making. And I, I would say corporates are at the beginning of that journey in terms of you know, figuring that out. There's more and more happening. And I think over the course of the next two years, you are gonna see more and more executive pay tied to some of these ESG principles, but we're all still learning and uh, trying to figure out how do we do that in the appropriate way so that you don't have this laundry list of things that you're focused on, but you're focused on perhaps a couple or maybe one big one that will make a difference um, in your future. Yeah, I, I'll add in there. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'll add in there that I think oftentimes it is important to have, you have to have the data, you have to have the metrics and I think tying it back to actual, um, you know, performance reviews, whatever it is, um, evaluations. But I also think one of the most important things is creating, having those call to ac actions and having clear expectations for all employees, right? Whether you're in a large organization or you're in, um, you know, a small one like myself, right? I, I worked in an organization that was, you know, and I thought about this at the 100,000 level, and now we've got about 100 employees. So, you know, the, the big to the small. And I think oftentimes it is very much creating, you um, creating the environment and the expectation. So you can say, well, what are the incentives to that? And it's like, well, the incentives are, you know, having a, having a great place to work and having a meaningful and purposeful um, career um, and company. But I do think oftentimes employees want to know how they can contribute, everyone, right? Obviously uh, managers and leaders are at the high level setting these strategic directions and, and setting the plans. But I think employees want to know as well, like what, what is my role? Right. What is my role in advancing um, gender equality or racial equality in the workplace? What is my role in um, um, volunteering, for example? What is my role as an employee in um, helping us meet our own sustainability goals? So I really think of it as broadly, you know, set the expectation people, create an, an enabling environment as well, um, and then think about, you know, what else? How do we incentivize? But the first part is creating that environment and the understanding of what's what's expected of people. And Melissa, I'm wondering, since your organization really had a very specific and sudden trigger that launched a new program, have you noticed a difference in employee or even supplier engagement with your business um, because of the way that you pivoted? 100%. Um, we've brought in like brand new suppliers that are, it's actually people right now that are continuing to build boxes, but the people that are building boxes are actually more food hubs, um, more diverse growers. We want to bring in, I just did another talk about um, how to raise up farmers of color and of uh, black farmers, BIPOC farmers, all different kinds of um, farmers. Um, and it was amazing, but it was, and they're being included in our boxes. Uh, I've also hired, but this is, I think, just on hiring in general and who you bring in based on the networks and how you more intentionally and how you make sure that you're, how you're hiring. Um, but I think I'm circling back to the beginning because I'm also in my traditional business, a vendor, a supplier, that also starts by who 
the governance of how you're setting who your suppliers and how depending on what they can do and how they're intentional and what they're setting for their companies, even though like in the grower world right now, it's not the easiest thing to be in the produce side to get your farm, how many women, how many BIPOC farmers, like that's not the easiest thing to do and you don't want the supply to end, but it's about the intention that the company's setting, what they're looking for. So I think if you can look at downstream on your supply chain and what you're asking of your suppliers, I think um, I'm sure one of you can speak more intelligently on this, but that's just to me, I think important um, because I know that that's really important. And then that gets the boardrooms of those companies speaking of it, if they're not as big of a company too, to speak about what the same things that we're talking about on this call so that we continue for you know um, positive progression for you know other companies as well. That's great. And um, we're getting very close to the end of our hour together. I'd like to invite you to um, add any thoughts that uh, you'd like to close with before I uh, take us out. No? Okay. I will say, I think we've said it, but you have to start, right? Dig in, go fast, learn, learn, learn. Julie said it so well, but I think it's this, uh, it's here. We're going there. We're all going there together. The journey. Um, just start. And I'll well, add, I think sometimes it's uncomfortable conversations that might even be uncomfortable conversations you can have in your own company, in your boardroom, but like you just have to have them. And there's like conversations that you can pre start it. Like, I don't know, there's like four, four courageous, there's some things that are out there on resources to set the meeting and the tone. Because sometimes there are uncomfortable things that if you haven't talked about them before, but you have to just get it out there, like you said, Carrie. And Melissa made me think of uh, one other thing. These subjects really engage your employees. And um, when one of the companies that I'm, whose board I'm on published their sustainability report and put their metrics and their data out there with their goals, it was amazing to the senior leaders, the employee response mm -hmm. and employees, we all do. We all wanna work for a company that wants to make a difference. And so I would say, don't forget that this is an incredibly important way to engage your employees and to make them feel great about the company that they're working for, that they really do wanna do something bigger than get a paycheck. They wanna make a difference in the world and particularly our younger employees, but I would say all of our employees. So it's a wonderful tool for you as well to recruit people to want to come to your company and to feel great about working there. Yes. Recruit them and keep them. Exactly. Well, well, with that, I'm going to uh, head into not keeping you any longer, but I want to thank you for such an incredible conversation and for everything that you all taught me in the course of preparing for this event. It's been wonderful to have such a cross section of experiences represented here. And I look forward to maybe doing this again, um, a year or two down the road, and we can all talk about how we were in the infancy now and look at how it's matured. So thank you very much. Thank you to our audience. And Jean, I'll turn it back over to you.